20 years, I mean, two decades, may sound like a really long time to pursue a passion, but for our guest artist, Renee Walden, it was filled with many creative endeavors, a teaching stint, and continuous learning. Her fascination for making things and to create outdoors became her catalyst to travel, do plein air, and teach art. In this episode, Renee drops some major truth bombs. Why determination pays off more than talent, having a good support system is a push that will keep you going, taking risk and making things, getting yourself a mentor is an excellent idea, why painting outdoors is an avenue for human connection, taking detours and savoring the time to learn can be your secret weapon to finding your niche, and the secret to painting fluffy clouds. If you want to be part of the conversation, then send in your questions and topics you want us to cover to hello at etrolab.com. Hey, this is Jesse from Etcher. We believe in your power to create, so we invited artists from all around the globe to inspire you to keep on creating. Join us in this journey and let's celebrate creativity. This is Make More Art, the podcast. Some of my fondest memories from childhood was always being really creative. Like right from when I was really little, soul, um, my grandfather was an artist. So, and I, I really, really loved my grandfather. And so, and he died when I was quite young, but he still instilled in me a love of art. It was kind of like a, he was like a hero, like, you know, a hero thing. And so I can picture myself still, you know, when I was really tiny, sitting with friends with, you know, massive coloring in books and drawing things. I was fascinated with houses even then. Uh, I was living in South Africa at the time. And I was fascinated with a particular type of architecture called Cape Dutch houses, very ornate. And then in high, then I went to high school and there was no art offered at my high school, nothing creative at all. It was a science, a science high school. Um, and so I didn't really, I got, I, my best subjects at high school were maths and biology. And even though I, oh yeah, I remember when in, in high school, I was kind of obsessed with creating stationery. And I created all sorts of, I know, wow. all sorts of personalized stationery for my friends, cards and, let, uh, you know, back in those days, we still used to write letters and things like that. And I had this dream that one day I was going to work for Hallmark. <laughs> I mean, can you believe it? <laughs> you got me at Hallmark. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but I didn't have any art at school as such, you know, not, nothing, no, no. Um, no classes or anything. And then towards the end of high school, my mom found me a pottery class run by a local potter. And so I joined that and I was in my late teens at that stage. And everybody else in the class was like five or six years old. <laughs> and I didn't care. I really didn't care. I absolutely loved it. So I guess my first sort of creative outlet was, was pottery. Then I went to university, I did a science degree, I did a higher diploma in education, and then I taught maths and biology for many years. And so the creativity side just kind of went to the side, although I did lots of botanical drawing because I had a degree in botany and zoology. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I was just in the science mode for a while. And then I, we, we moved to New Zealand and I saw an ad for night classes for pottery mm -hmm. okay. at the local high school. And pottery. there was just like, mm -hmm. a continuation. And I was like, yes, yeah. that's what I wanted to do. So I got really into that. I'm quite obsessive when I get into something. <laughs> <laughs> so I got my night classes. I uh, bought a wheel. My dad helped me build a Raku kiln. And so for a while, it was back to ceramics and pottery as mm -hmm. my creative outlet. I've always been happiest when I'm making something. So that was that. But then my husband and I started a business and there wasn't any time to do the ceramics anymore because it takes so much time. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to plan ahead what you're going to be doing each day. You know, you might make it today. Yeah. Tomorrow it needs a handle. The next day it needs to be fired. You know. So... Um, so the ceramics was kind of not happening and I still needed a creative outlet. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to learn to draw. And I, I have to be honest, I was useless, absolutely useless. Even I'd lost all of that, 
that um that boldness that you have when you're a child yeah you know mm -hmm. as an adult you're just so self-critical and I just but I was determined I was like I want to do this and even though I could see <laughs> I had no real talent I just stuck with it and uh -huh. the journey's been slow uh that was 20 years ago I think 20 years ago was when I first did my first drawing class and uh because I was running a business, I didn't really have time mm -hmm. to really focus on it. But I stuck at it. And then I started painting in acrylics and watercolors. And I guess it really changed. Um, in 2007, we, we went on a big trip to Europe, my husband and I, a climbing trip to Europe. And I packed a sketchbook. And I'd been taking sketchbooks already whenever we went anywhere. But... This time I took a, a small watercolor set and a sketchbook. And on my very first day, I met another climber who was an artist. Oh. And that changed everything. Okay. Because it, it, was, it was amazing. We, we, we were both web designers, both climbers, and she was an artist with fine, you know, fine arts behind her. And she had a sketchbook and she sketched everything. Uh, like she would sketch us sitting at the table or her cup of tea or something hanging on the line mm, yeah and it was mind-blowing to me it just I was like I was so inspired and so on that trip I filled my sketchbook uh, I met her again later in the trip we went to Barcelona for a few days and we sketched uh, in Barcelona which was wonderful and that's when my obsession with travel sketching started and then the big thing that came was in 2012 we sold our business uh -huh. I could become a, I could become a full time artist. Wow! So yeah, so it's a long story, and it took a long time. And I guess what I tell my students is that the moral of the story is I didn't have any talent, but I was really determined. It was something that was deep. It satisfied something deep inside me. Um, and you can get there. You can get there. You just have to to know what you want. <laughs> Very long rambling story you didn't expect no, something I, I, I was like please go on please go on I would like to hear more but that's very <laughs> interesting and going back to the very first when you initially shared the story about your grandfather and how much you loved him and that a part of him is still instilled in yeah. you because he's an artist and looking at that journey from that to now it's like everything just came full circle and it's the, the memories of your grandfather is still in there and you've always yeah. been creative I I love that I your mom been. is very supportive supportive of you and uh even enrolled you into a pottery class I love pottery as well but it's kind of hard when I was in Singapore it's a little bit hard to do kilns so I ended up doing air dry clay instead but what yeah. I love about your story is also that you study uh you taught math and biology it was like totally <laughs> different from art and now you're teaching art so it's that that is really what I love about you know hosting this this podcast and interviewing artists because you get to really learn from the stories from the journey of the people that I interview here on the pod and just that story alone I learned a lot especially that golden nugget that you shared that you didn't have talent and I refuse to believe that initially because wow, looking at your works and how, you know, how beautiful they are, how excellent the techniques are, no. yeah. people will be surprised that you really, you know, you stick by it, that you yeah. took the time to really, to really learn, even enrolled in a, you know, in a class. So, okay. So in, I, I think I've read in your, in one of your posts that you started in 2007, is that right? Yes, 2007. Well, that wasn't when I started. I actually started mm -hmm. in uh, nine, 99. Okay. Last century. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean, okay. I, in 99, my husband bought me a very small watercolor set. So I guess I sort of started then. Mm -hmm. But 2007 was the big breakthrough for me because we took a three month trip to Europe. Okay. And my, my husband had a climbing partner for that trip. So suddenly I had time to, to sketch. To and sketch. That was, 2007 was when I guess I started what they now call urban sketching. Yeah. Um, and that was when, that's when it was when I, I saw 
myself really improve because I was sketching every day. I was documenting absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was really like a breakthrough time for me. But it wasn't really until 2012, like five years later, when we sold yeah. our business, that I could, you know, really focus on focus what I was on. Doing. Yeah. Uh, what I, I like that your it was your husband who bought you the the water. Cooler. <laughs> it's always been like you're surrounded with people who are very yeah. supportive. Oh, that's um, important. Yes, yes. You need to find people who are going to support you because uh, art is quite a lonely thing in a way. You know, we spend a lot of time in our own head and in our own studios or quietly painting in a corner. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be hard for people who love you to understand that you that you need to do this. So you need to you need you need them to understand that and you need to just quietly make it clear <laughs> that it's important to you. I, yeah. I, I saw in one of your posts as well. I think it's a recent post about reflections, right? And yeah. um, there were, I think, how many photos were there? And you said that it might look like I'm alone in this photo, but there is someone <laughs> in the background who's happy with yeah. every little doodle that I make and who's <laughs> patiently taking the photos. And that's really like what you said, it's really important to have someone who it's will support important. you in this creative endeavors. Now, you you said that it all started like 1999. And now in 2012, that's when you sold your business, that's when you went full time. But from 1999 before to 2012, uh, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you didn't have talent, but you just kept going. What yeah. kept you going all these years? Because I think it's a normal dilemma for some of the artists like when you're frustrated and you can get the, the kind of technique or the kind of style that you really want people often okay maybe it's not for me so I'll stop what yeah. kept you going all those years of uh, painting I think there's two things that kept me going was one thing I I really realized was that when that I'm always happiest when I'm making something uh, and it doesn't really matter what it is that I'm making uh, you know, I make, might make ca Christmas cards for my friends or, or little Christmas ornaments, or I might bake a really fancy bread. But realizing that about myself, that I, I needed to be making things. And then I think the next most important thing is to find someone who can mentor you. And I, I think nowadays we, we go onto YouTube to, to learn something, or we we join someone's Patreon. But actually having, I, I was very lucky in about 2004, mm -hmm. I found a local uh, art teacher who, who I, I then went to classes with her on and off and figure life drawing lessons and things like that for a couple of years. And she was a wonderful support. Now, I don't think she thought I had any talent, but she could see my determination. Mm -hmm. And she was just incredibly supportive. And I think you can either find someone who's another artist or join a group of like-minded people uh, so that you get so that you get some positive feedback to fight the, the critic that's sitting on your shoulder. Because that critic's always there saying, oh, that's yes. not good. Everybody else is really good. You're still right. struggling. Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. And if you are open to listening to somebody else's compliments because people are very complimentary <laughs> of what you're doing. They are. Uh -huh. And if mm -hmm. you're open to listening to that and if you find a supportive uh, group or even an individual who can help you, that's, that goes a long way to to helping you go forward, I think. I'm glad you brought that up, having a, a mentor. Yeah. I think it's, it's, a, it's a fact that sometimes is overlooked when you're trying to learn something. Of course, there are a lot of like information and source resources that yeah. you have out there, but it can be very distracting at the same time. So having yeah. what you said, a mentor who would really journey with you, I believe it, it'd yeah. be really important. And talking about teaching, uh, and having a community. I know that you have a pretty engaged community um, and students who really go to you for yes. classes. Um, when did the, your background as a teacher really helped you a lot? Because one thing that I noticed in your tutorials, and I, I talked about this offline earlier, is that it's very detailed and you can really feel that his think, you are thinking about the student, but you're teaching from a student perspective, that these are the things that they these are the questions that they have in mind and so I am addressing them what 
your background is math and biology. How does that influence you? Because in, that's a little different from art, like teaching art. So how did you merge those two together in order to provide like a curriculum and like an art session that students would really benefit from? Well, my mom would say my mom's my mom's a primary school teacher. Well, and she taught for something like 40 years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> mom said it really was in the family, like art and then teaching. Amazing. You were born a teacher. Uh-huh. I, I'm not sure that that's exactly true uh, but I suspect that there are just some folks who are okay. <laughs> uh, can see it from the student's perspective yeah uh, and I taught high school students uh, and I'll, I'll fully admit I only did it for five years and then I was burned out mm. but teaching adults is a whole different thing it's 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 really wonderful and I I think what's what I mean, you're seeing it from my, from the student's perspective of me breaking it down and giving it to the student. But I learn so much about my own painting by breaking it down okay. to teach it to the students. Mm -hmm. I, you know, like when, a... you, when you think, okay, I, I, I want to teach someone how to paint a landscape. Yeah. Well, the first thing I need to think is, well, why do I do things that way? You know, mm, okay. why, why? Because the student will say, "Why did you do the tree last and not first? And then right, I have to think, yeah. "Okay, why?" So what the first reverse thing, engineering when I, everything. Yeah, when mm. I started teaching, I thought I need to first start analyzing why I do things, and then, then, wow, then I I learned stuff about my art that that I could put into like actual processes, things mm. that were just automatic, and mm. so. Yeah, I can't. I can't say that. I, I'd say that my teachings got better over time, for yeah. sure. <laughs> and you do after a while, uh, you do get the same questions again and again. So you uh -huh. sort of know what's going to be coming up. But the, the 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 joy of seeing somebody pick up a brush for the first time yeah. and and go for it, and then seeing their improvement in a year. You know, it's just uh, to fo follow that journey is just wonderful. Yeah, it's priceless even. And <laughs> it's priceless. yeah, and the, I think you nailed it when you said that you are also learning when you when you were breaking yeah. down the process, you also learn. So it's like really a two way. And I think that's really the joy of teaching art. And um, yeah. when I look at you and I see all of your tutorials, it's really evident how much you love it. And like what you said, <laughs> Teaching adults is like entirely, it makes you happy. Yeah. Um, I specifically watched this video of you teaching landscape. So there, it's a photograph of, um, it's a houses and there were mountains in the background and then clouds. And I think this is on your About Me page and your website. And I specifically like it because I don't do well in landscapes. I, I think I have a hard time like placing things and then especially <laughs> the clouds it's like it should be easy but how come it's so hard to, to make it look like puffy clouds you know but the way that you break it down and one interesting tip that you that you shared is that you don't blot the you don't pick up the the, the colors you dry yeah. you uh, and correct me if I'm wrong you you clean dry and what's the third one yeah, so the idea with the idea with the clouds is if you just take the piece of paper, the paper, piece of uh, paper towel, and you dry soften. I remember. Yeah, they're going, dry they're, soften. Yeah, they're going to look like children's puffy, puffy uh -huh. clouds. Yeah. And what we what you're trying to do is just with the with the paper is to stop the paint going where it's not supposed to. Mm -hmm. So wherever you dry paper, watercolor won't flow in there. It just only flows where the layer of water is. Right. Kind of resonated with me because clouds, specifically clouds. So what I learned before was that you blot the, the colors, like you yeah. pick up the colors within the clouds. So the one that has blue and ultramarine in it. So you blot the colors yeah. using your tissue. But with your technique, it's clean, dry, soft. It's at the other <laughs> So it's like yeah. you're blotting the, the white parts, not the one with yeah, colors. Yeah. Those that, that was a specific like technique that, oh, that's very interesting because it's different from, from what I know, like painting clouds. And um, <laughs> and then the mountains, and then you painted them like in, in, in colors that are not usually the colors of like the mountains, 
like you have uh, I think it's Shanna and then um, yellow but it's not too like saturated yeah. like in the background it's, and you use cool colors so those are some like techniques that for someone who was a beginner it was like oh that's just really something new I never really thought of that <laughs> so that's why I said that you know if you have a different way of teaching and I I, I believe the, the your experience uh, teaching students really played a major part in that and um one other thing as well, Renee, when I was looking at your feet, I feel like I'm traveling. Like one of us just fit me while looking at Renee and I feel like, oh, I need to travel soon. So what, what, what okay, and you do a lot of plein air. Um, yeah. So take me to that journey of how you make that decision to do plein air and to do travel um, painting, sketching. Make More Art, the podcast is made possible by listeners like you. So we would like to give a shout out to Dalcini X from YouTube. And she said, art should be something that should be done for its own sake. Great video. Make sure you never miss an episode by clicking the subscribe button now. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. I guess, the, the, yeah, I said that I'm, I'm happiest when I'm making things. Mm -hmm. But I guess to be perfectly honest, I'm also happiest when I'm outside. Oh, so I do, okay. I do uh, spend a lot of time in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. So it used to be, it used to be before the painting side took over. It used to be climbing and hiking, camping, biking. You know, so mm -hmm. all of those things me outside and I mean I grew up camping with my parents so being outside and being in nature is really important to me and so it just seems natural it seemed natural to me to want to paint outside as well yeah. Yeah. and so um, I used to in the beginning you know I like most people you experiment with all sorts of things I took canvases outside and acrylics and I tried pastels and you know, all those types of things. But for me, it eventually just, I worked out that the the trick to painting outside is to have as little equipment as possible. Okay. So that, you you know, that so you can set up quickly and the, the shadows and the rain and the wind and all of those things mm -hmm. that you're dealing with you need to be, keep it nice and simple. And so watercolors just made sense. And uh, then when I traveled, a sketchbook made sense because it's so lovely to keep a record of your journey. Yeah. And, uh, for a long time people said to me well actually they still say it to me you know they'll they'll stop and chat to me and they'll see a painting in my sketchbook and they'll think oh it's such a pity that that's in a sketchbook you know <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can't take that out can't you tear it out and frame it and <laughs> I think they're kind of missing the point that uh, those uh, sketches are just for me they're hmm. my personal journey yeah. And uh, no, you can't buy them. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. A, you have a lot of sketchbooks because you mentioned that you started traveling in Europe for six months since 2012. And yes. ever since then, you've been bringing your. So, like, a top of mind, how many sketchbooks do you have now? So, is it like one per year? I, or? You'd be surprised. I don't actually, I'm not exceptionally prolific uh -huh. because I don't paint very fast. Oh, I. Okay. So each, each sketch that you see of mine online takes, uh, you know, even if they're A5 size, which is my preference for working at the moment, mm -hmm. they take about two hours to do. Okay. So, um, and I don't, a lot of people say, oh, you sketch every day. No, I don't. You know, okay. I do yeah, actually, that's another question that I was about to ask you. <laughs> I do actually have other things that are of interest to me. Uh -huh. So um, I don't sketch absolutely every day. I, you know sometimes I do but it's, you know there might be a gap yeah so for instance in this last in this last tri trip to Europe I was there for five months and I only did two full sketchbooks uh, mm -hmm. and each page spread has a you know it might it has the story in notes and uh, usually a bigger sketch and maybe some couple of smaller sketches so each page spread takes many hours to do Mm -hmm. And that's my preference. I'm a details person and okay. I don't like to rush from one thing to another. I'm not about yeah. like Same grabbing it. Yeah. yeah. I think people commented that you have like beautiful spots to paint. <laughs> and I was like, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you've been in France and you're from South Africa. You were South African, yeah. right, Renee? But you were born in New Zealand. No, and I was born. 
South Africa. And South Africa and, and oh, okay, yeah. the other way. Yeah. And New Zealand, yeah. it's just the when whenever I see photos from my friends who travel there, like it's it's like it looks like a painting. <laughs> so like every spot is just <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. Like yeah. Is there ever a time because probably one of the things that people would ask is, is it like uncomfortable to paint outside and then people are hovering you know people watching you like you know finish your painting have you ever ha- felt that or had that experience or even thought of that prior to doing plein air yeah lots of people say to me they're too scared to go painting outside because yes. they're scared to talk to them mm-hmm. but uh there's a couple of things with that is the first thing is that people who stop and chat for the most part they're not artists and they are amazed at what you're doing you know when i first started and my sketches were really awful and i even knew that they were awful people still thought they were amazing okay. so you know no one is going to be unkind okay and the the other thing is that i've met amazing people because i've you know you'll sit somewhere in a little village in the t- in tiny little village in the pyrenees or something and a local shepherd will come up and he's like in his 90s and he's lived there all his life and because you're doing something that's unusual and not uh it's not offensive or invasive or anything like that mm-hmm. and you start these conversations and i've met the most amazing people so i see i don't i don't i kind of value when people stop to chat to me i always learn something mm-hmm. and people are always really kind so And even in busy places, I've you know I've sketched in Barcelona or Venice and yeah. places like that, which are really busy and lots of people stop. But yeah, it's part for me. It's part of it. I I really don't mind it. Okay, so that is really more of like a an inspiration for people who want to start plein air. If yeah. you are having doubts, oh, okay. take it. Yeah, go ahead, Rene. Get a buddy and go sketching with a buddy. You know, safety in numbers, so <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> agree <laughs> and what would be your let, let's just say will be your f- favorite okay place if you are to go back to that place again and sketch what would that be oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> one place. just one just one if you are to go back one. again if you've been to that place and if you are to go back again which one of those places you're going to go back to the spanish, the spanish Pyr- pyrenees, is, pyrenees at the moment is, is the main love yeah Oh. It has everything, you know. I love mountains. It's got really, really big mountains. Mm-hmm. It's got tiny villages. I really like old, you know, old villages. Oh, it's got hardly yeah. any people. Um, oh. I'm a bit, I'm not too much in love with big crowds. I don't really like cities too much. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that 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 ticks all the boxes. Good climbing, really good hiking, great places for. Yeah, you know, we live in a van. So great places for living in a van. So yeah, I would say the Spanish Pyrenees. But if I was to choose a city, I would love to go back to Venice. Uh, oh, I would, Venice, I love Venice. Paradise, and that that would be if I could get brave enough because it's, it is kind of exhausting all of that hustle and bustle. Yeah. But yes, Venice. Oh yeah, Venice. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Venice, and yeah, it's it's just a magical city, like yeah. on, on water, and then you know the yeah. And even the the there were I think it was Murano with the like the the pastel houses, colored. Houses. Oh yeah, it's yeah. just got everything you need. Yeah. It we just took the people away, but even it just took the people away. <laughs> it's very touristy. It wouldn't be quite uh, the same without the people. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. Thank thank you, Renee. Okay. What made you decide to really push or push through with watercolor? Because this is I, I think I'm gonna get like fifty fifty. Mm. reaction from people who would say no watercolor is the best medium to start with no acrylic would be the best medium to start with so what how do you weigh those two if you are let's say uh recommend a media to someone who would like to start making art i think for me the if you want to paint outside watercolor is super convenient you know it's it doesn't a lot you your gear is really minimal it's very lightweight it's easy to clean up It, mm-hmm. it doesn't ruin your brushes where it dries on it, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, for me, originally, I only used water for color for painting outside. And then when I did studio work, I painted in acrylics and mixed media. And 
right back in the beginning when I when I had my first watercolor teacher, I've only actually had one one weekend of watercolor teaching way back in I think 2001. On the second day, the watercolor teacher, he was very strict, very traditional. He said to me, you know, he was he was quite critical on the first day. And the second day, he looked at one of my tiny little paintings and he said, hmm, that's got potential. It was about as complimentary as he And then he said to me, you know, I don't want you to try anything else now. You just need to stick to watercolors. Don't like, you know, go get into pastels and try ink and all of that stuff. If you want to learn watercolors, you need to just do watercolors. And of course I totally ignored him, you know, because I wanted to try everything. <laughs> yes. But three years ago I thought, okay, if I'm going to do watercolors and really get somewhere, mm -hmm. I think he's right. <laughs> Okay, so, for, <laughs> so let's heed his advice. Watercolor. Yes, it's like <laughs> nearly twenty years later, I suddenly thought, okay, maybe it's right. And okay, uh, certainly since I've only been painting in watercolors now mm -hmm. for the last three years, I can see an improvement for sure. It, it needed that dedication from me uh -huh. because I'm, as I said, I'm a slow learner. So, uh, you know, in order to really get somewhere with it, and now I'm feeling like I'd like to go back to doing. I'm missing the big canvases for oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. People um, are asking for the big canvases, not just your sketchbook. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to doing some mixed media painting again this this New Zealand summer. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I won't take I won't take all of that stuff outside for sure. The watercolors is it's such a oh it's such a fantastic medium. It's, right. it's a joy in the process. That I can't get from any other medium. Uh, it doesn't. Even, I don't even care what it looks like at the end, because you know that first dab of the watercolor to the paper is such a wonderful, tactile, magical feeling. Yeah. I I don't get that from another medium for I sure. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Absolutely agree. There is something, and I think you mentioned that in one of your draws. It's the magic of watercolor when it's it's magical. Yeah. yeah, it bleeds yeah. and yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for all the, the tips and tricks that you shared. But if there are like top three golden nuggets that you would like to share with our listeners who are mostly beginners and would like to make more art, what would they be? I guess things that have made a real bit difference for me was uh, going out with other people. It's kind of like it's kind of like getting gym buddies because <laughs> if you make a plan with someone else, you'll stick to it. And when you're, when you're in a kind of a funk and you've got no ideas, just going out with other creative people is, is really important. So find a, if, you, if you have to pay for it and you have to join a class, then that's fine. But if you can join just a, a local art group or your watercolor society or something like that, I think that's, that's really important. And take risks. I had one of, my, one of my earlier teachers said to me, it's just a piece of paper. You know, you can always start again and a piece of paper has two sides. So it doesn't have to be a serious thing, you know, just just go for it. And everything, just draw everything, paint everything. You know, your your life is Im important. Just document the whole thing. Yeah. Love it. Wow. <laughs> Especially <laughs> the, the paper has two sides. It can be very daunting, you know, the blank canvas, paper. Yeah, yeah very daunting for some. But thank you, Renee, for sharing that and for sharing all your stories and journeys. Like what I said, I feel like I'm traveling when I look at your photos and um, hearing you talk about the journeys and the places that you've been and how you painted them in plein air. It's just so inspiring. And hopefully the people well, who listen you. to this episode will really go out there, you know, take a buddy with you, like what Renee said. <laughs> take a buddy. Hey, and just paint everything and document every bit, especially right now that we, you know, yeah. we that life is so so precious we want to capture yeah. every moment if you can do that in a painting just like what Renee uh, mentioned <laughs> earlier then do that Renee happy holidays you know have Merry thank Christmas you. thank you so much for being on Make More Art the podcast and hope to see Pleasure. more of you and your works um, on the gram and thank you for teaching with us for that sure I know the recording is still up in our website so um if you want to check that out, go ahead and check the Etcher Studio website and you will find Renee's recording. Thank you so much, Renee. Please stay safe. Enjoy the summer in New Zealand. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'll speak to you again soon. Thank you so much for being on the show.
Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Renee's journey tells us that there is no need to rush, that we all have our timelines and paths that we need to go through. And in every season of whatever creative endeavor you decide to take on, savor each moment and put on your determination hat, take it slow, and be not afraid to take risks. What's your biggest takeaway from this episode? Do let us know by sharing your comments through the blog post associated with this podcast at etcherlab.com slash Renee. Want to know what goes behind the scenes here at Etcher? We heard ya. We are lifting the curtain and giving you VIP access to do just that. Get to know who does what here at Etcher Lab. So joining me for the Etcher team spotlight is Jessica Supangan. One thing that you need to know about her, if Kurt considered himself as an airbender, this girl right here knows how to bend time. And with that, I mean, she works day and night. And she is referred to as the queen bee of the studio admin team. So please welcome to the show, Jessica Supangan. Hi, Jess. Hi, Jesse. How are you? <laughs> so we're both Jessica, but we have different nicknames. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So one thing also that's interesting about you, Jess, is that you are a published author. I think I've read mm-hmm. that in your bio. So before yes. we dive into the whole etcher and how you started, what was the book that you written? Um, I wrote the, that book when I was 15 years old. Wow. And then a few years later, it got published when I was 20. So it got published in a publishing house in Nevada, USA, and it's available worldwide. Wow. Yeah, it's a romance a book. Author, an international <laughs> published author. That's amazing. You wrote that at the age of 15, and then mm-hmm. it got published at the age of, after five years. Mm-hmm. And yes. it's an international publishing house. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. Okay. Yay. So let's talk about Etcher. I know that you're one of the pioneers. Like, like you're one of the mm-hmm. you who started the whole thing. I remember when... Din, Danny was flashing the, the slides where in the old, we had 11 employees and now we're up to 39. So can you take us to how you started with Etcher? I started at the beginning of Etcher Studio. So Etcher Studio started around July 2021. And then I started September. So it was all f- from scratch and everything. We, we really don't know what to do. We really didn't know what to do at that time. And yeah, I started in the marketing team as a community manager. And then after a few months, I got promoted as the head administrator here because I started here in September where in I, I think I, ba- I built the foundation somehow. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. So you really basically started. So you were part of the, did you say marketing? Uh, yes, yeah, I started marketing. in the marketing team. We refer to you as the queen bee because you take <laughs> good care of your beehive, of all the studio admin. So what is a, can you share with us what does a day look like for you as a studio admin manager? Well, my main tasks are, of course, trying to optimize the process of the admins, the other admins, making sure that they are enjoying their tasks and making it easier. So that's what I usually do. I always try to find uh, ways to make their tasks easier. And yeah, like if I gave them a specific task, I always think about how can we do this smoother? So that's one of my main tasks as a head admin. And I think you're doing an awesome job taking good care of the admins. I, I was speaking to Mark, uh, and he's like the the only guy within the <laughs> within the studio admin team. I was surprised. But how has it been when you started handling the studio admins, and you know, with all the transitions that we've had, what kept you going? What kept you inspired to continue doing your role? really well as a studio admin manager uh, i think it's the like the directors and the other staff members because here at etcher uh, we are really a very happy family <laughs> like i can say that etcher is like a family to me and all of even the ceos the directors and everyone is really empathetic they are very attentive to all our needs and despite all like minor issues they are still there to help us 
and as well as the uh, as the community as well our students who enroll in their classes they are very sweet they send us emails and messages that are very very like, very sweet and understanding in case of issues <laughs> so yeah <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right when it comes to our community. They're very engaged and they really provide like constructive feedback and like sweet feedback, like what you said. Very encouraging feedback so that we continue to do our best to service our students and our clients. Yes. Um, one other question. I know that you are you love poetry, like poems, and of course, I bet you love reading, but have you done or started any art? What after joining? <laughs> oh, I did like a few sketches, but I think it's not ready for the public to see <laughs> yet. <laughs> so, but yeah, I did a few sketches. I also tried a few swatches with watercolor. Mm-hmm. Uh, Etcher gave me a watercolor set and a sketch pad. Wow. I think last year, so I tried that. And yeah, Etcher has really like somehow honed my artistic skills, but I'm not ready to show that to everyone yet. But soon, it, maybe it will come. I bet. I bet it will come <laughs> pretty soon. Okay, so what is next? I mean, you are an author. You are managing an excellent team with an Etcher. What's next for Jess? Mm, I think I want to have my own coffee shop someday with books and then like wherein they can also paint so we, we I came from a family of artists wow. so everyone almost everyone in my family are artists so maybe in sometime in the near future I can have a coffee shop that's also a bookshop where everyone can paint I think we are aligned when it comes to having a coffee shop. I would love to have one and when people can gather together and paint as well. But I am sure, Jess, with, as a 15-year-old, you wrote and then got published at 20. Who knows what you're going to be doing the next 10 years, right? So mm-hmm. yeah. definitely keep at it. All right, Just it's been amazing chatting with you. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I know we talk every day. Uh, you know, well, not almost every day, but we get to see each other over Slack. And then, you know, we recently had our social gathering. It's been nice talking with you and getting to know you. And wow, published author, internationally published author, which is amazing. So looking forward to working with you. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank thanks you so for much. Merry well. Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Thank you. We would love to hear your thoughts, so please drop us a five-star review on the Apple Podcast or you can find us on YouTube at Etcher Studio. And, oh, hitting the subscribe button is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you again next time. Until then, let's make more art.